And welcome back. You're listening to Linda Pinizzato here at the Condo Expert at the Hayes FM. I've been covering some of the uh, emails that have been sent in to me, just asking for answers to a number of different concerns and questions. And I'm finding that these are duplicated questions. They're not, they're not into, you know, there could be some that are specific to a particular unit, but overall, I'm finding that a lot of people across the province tend to have a lot of the same concerns. There was one person who asked about mold. Now, you know, mold is very interesting. I think if you went and asked uh, any home inspector, they're going to say to you that mold is accumulative. So it's a, it's porous, it's growing, it's continuously growing if, in fact, the moisture keeps coming into the same area. So if there's any degree of a leak, say, for instance, you live in a condominium and there's a leak on the roof, and you could very well be maybe on the fifth floor, yet the building is 10 stories high. Believe it or not, depending on where the direction of the water is flowing, it could very well end up on your ceiling, but not on your next door neighbor's ceiling. In this particular case, there was a lot of mold being reported in the garage ceiling. Now, mold is something that cannot be ignored. It is definitely a health issue. So what had happened was that this person decided to go to the property manager and they sent in a complaint, took photographs, and informed property management and the board of directors that they found mold in the ceiling of the garage underground. Unfortunately, nothing was done. A week was passed, a couple of weeks was passed, a couple of months was passed. They were very, very concerned because they had small children. And because they have a lower unit, they had a main floor unit, so they felt that the, uh, the mold was actually coming into where their unit is and it was making their children ill. Now, unfortunately, we're talking about a health safety standard here. And rather than sitting back and, you know, banging your head up against the wall when your property manager and your board of directors are not dealing with this issue, and especially in particular if you have small children, unfortunately, your only out would be is to report it. And reporting it to the health and safety would be the first measure to take. And you'd have to do it. There's no two ways about it. Now, if you were turning around and doing that, now, the other thing you could do, too, is you could possibly contact your municipality and register a complaint there as well. Rather than letting it sit back, unfortunately, you know, if, if a board is not addressing this, a property management is not addressing this, this cannot be left unattended to. And that would be about the only advice that I can offer you, because if they're not looking after it, they're not repairing it, well, there's not much more you can do other than go to the officials. So it doesn't matter where the mold is, if you see mold anywhere at all, it is a smart decision to do. Obviously, if it's in your unit, it's coming from somewhere in the common elements. It cannot be just growing in your unit because it's just in your unit. It has to be coming from whether the interior walls or maybe interior pipings that's leaking, something. Now, having said that, you know, the other day I was dealing with an issue with respect to pipes and how there was some buildings across the province that, believe it or not, when they sold these buildings, they actually had the piping as part of the ownership for the condo unit. So if you do have mold, I mean, yes, you could run into a case where the responsibility could be with the unit owners if, in fact, those pipes are owned by the condo unit owners as opposed to the corporation. So you might want to take a real fast look at your condo documents just to see where the responsibility and the ownership is for certain items within your building before you step forward. But, you know, that will not take you long. That'll take you all of maybe an hour to track that down. And if you can't find it, really, the expenditure, take a moment, show it to a lawyer, and find out exactly what it is that you bought. So Because if you do own those pipes and there is a problem up there, then at least you know about them. You know, interesting enough, sometimes you have to think as to whether or not these problems are coming from real high rises like 25, 30, 40, 50 story buildings, or are they coming from, you know, low rises of five to 10 stories, or are they coming from townhouses? It's actually universal. There doesn't seem to be any direction towards one versus the other. I think that you just get a little bit more complaints if you have more people in a building. So high density in condo corporations certainly means that there has to be more effort within owners to work together because there's a lot more owners involved. There is an advantage to that, though, because if there is a serious problem in a condo, the expenditure, it's a lot better to divvy up the expenditures amongst a lot of people than it would be to only divvy it up between, say, you know, 60 or 70 people that own in this one condo corporation. 
So in actual fact, you know, I've seen a lot of different buildings where their maintenance fees are higher, especially if they have less condo units to share up the cost. You know, balconies is an important issue. That was another one. I think we've gotten a uh, several several emails from condo owners who own condominium units and they're very concerned about leaks on their balcony and they feel that the leaks are affecting their flooring because they're coming in through the sliding patio doors. There's always a big no-no out there. Believe it or not, there's people that decide rather than bringing their pets downstairs they're just going to use the balcony. So honestly, don't do that. Balconies are porous and the stains, never mind the breakdown of the concrete from the uh, pet urines is not a good thing. It's going to create irrevocable damage which is going to cost so much money to repair so seriously don't now one thing i'm going to mention is is that in this particular situation is that they determined that the building specs when they looked through the building specs they found out that it would roughly be when they got quotes they found out it would be about $1500 to do some repairs on the balcony and there was because there was some damage around the side wall of the balcony it became a big conflict between the condo owner and the corporation because the question was is where did the responsibility lie after numerous conversations back and forth the board actually did end up claiming the rights on that only because it was determined that it was a shared facility area or a common element area and this particular condo owner did not have to pay the $1500 cost that the board had originally summoned against the unit. So that was a good thing. And it was only because instead of just paying it, the condo board owner or the, sorry, the condominium owner made the decision to do a little bit of research to just find out where the responsibility was. So that was actually a really good story. And what happens is is again, you know, it becomes information awareness. I mean, if you know where to look and you can get the right answer, you should be able to get through these process of difficulties that might be coming ahead of you and you know it obviously is not going to be quite so frustrating if you can find the information learn what you're doing and try and work together with the board as opposed to getting into an all in all out fight and at the end of the day you can't really get a proper resolution because again it becomes a responsibility issue you know have you actually thought uh, you know recently we just updated the uh, condo owners association toronto website uh it's actually filled with information and i think as time goes on you know what we're going to do is have a a question answer bring up some of these items right on the website so people can you know kind of click on and go into it and maybe get some answers that will help them to understand a little bit i know that one issue that comes to play constantly is secondhand smoke you know there hasn't been any anything addressing that i've seen uh, i don't even see it too much in the media because don't forget you know all the venting systems that are going through condominiums you know it's very possible that secondhand smoke is going to be moving around from unit to unit and you know there isn't there isn't really too much of a way to stop that because when people are going inside the unit and closing the door how do you then determine which unit it is where the secondhand smoke is coming from so that's that's a topic out there that i welcome people in the industry that might have a solution to different methods that might be a, a smart thing like i know that there's certain toxins that that people are avoiding that are within the buildings uh, what was it a couple of years ago i was actually downtown toronto and i had to go into this building and it was amazing there was when i got there there was firemen everywhere there was police cruisers and luckily the gentleman that was blocking off the road i knew very well and i asked him i said what is going on over here well it turned out that somebody had reported that there was a meth lab in the condominium building Luckily somebody on that particular floor started to wonder <laughs> what was going on because of the materials that this uh, person that was living in that unit was bringing back and forth as it turned out it was actually a tenant not an owner that was uh, bringing really strange boxes and materials up and down and they started to get some kind of fumes that was going on in their unit and after they they you know thought that maybe they better contact the authorities and get some more information on it and it was more of you know what's happening kind of a question when the pieces started to all come down then the police realized that it could very well have been a meth lab so they decided to go out and investigate and sure enough that's exactly what it was so you know it's uh, it's a matter of staying on top of things and watching what's going on with your neighbors i mean it's no different if you're living in a house you do want to keep an eye on what's going on in your streets so you know i want to talk a little bit you know there's i'm going to break away from this for a few minutes and i'm going to talk about where the market is headed right now 
because yesterday I actually got a call from one of the local media because they were really concerned there were some buildings uh, here in Mississauga that seem to have an awful lot of listings on the market right now. And they were wondering whether or not that was, you know, a, a thought of whether we're seeing a slowdown on activity in condominiums or where it was, or whether or not it was something that was directly relating to that particular site. You know, it, it's interesting because he depends on what goes on in every building, especially if you have this one here they were asking about was the absolute. And the absolute is, is very well known here in the city of Mississauga. And of course, you know, during the whole phases of construction, it got the most amount of media attention, you know, strictly because of the design of it. And, you know, it was very, very unique. And I mean, you can see it from blocks and blocks and blocks. So as far as uh, where the market is headed right now, there is, I mean, granted, there are quite a few properties that are on the market right now in that whole complex. And interesting enough, sometimes when you see a lot of units in one or two buildings or three or four buildings, you start to wonder if automatically something is wrong with the complex. And, and this is predominant. It doesn't matter where it is. It can be here in Mississauga. It can be in downtown Toronto. It can be in Hamilton or Burlington. It can be in Oshawa. Sometimes it really is incumbent on why people have purchased a unit. You know, so you do get people that have bought a unit, they've decided to put a tenant in it for a couple of years, and then they've decided that they no longer want to be a landlord. So, of course, they then put it on the market. Right now, we're in a really, you know, the top of the season, April, May market, where a lot of activity and listings start to hit the marketplace. So once we start to see what exactly happens, I know that there's some listings right now that have sold conditional and they're just a matter of clearing out and it'll give me an idea of where the pricing is in comparison to where the list price is. And we can kind of determine a little bit more about where the direction of that particular complex is going. But right now I have to say, I mean, I was very surprised at how many listings there were on the market. And I guess my first question was, is looking at the maintenance fees in the buildings, I noticed that there was a strong variation between number 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90 absolute. And I was quite surprised about that. So, you know, the structure of that particular complex is very unique only because you have a lot of buildings. You have a 30,000 square foot recreational area that is shared between all the buildings so it's a, it's a very different design. And whenever you get different designs like that, there's always going to be different reasons as to why the maintenance fees has headed in the direction, plus the age. I mean, one building has built one year, and then the next one is launched, and the next one's launched, and the next one's launched. So, you know, there's different times of when those budgets are coming up for renewal, and then, of course, different issues that had to be dealt with in each building. Plus, the tear-on warranties within each building have a different date on them as well. So there's a lot of different reasons as to why maintenance fees and values in particular corporations that are all within the same complex are different from one another. And, you know, as a realtor, a long time, I mean, I've been a realtor for 33 years. And generally, if I see the financials and if I see the information, recognizing where the values are, I can pretty much just, you know, tell you where I think things, what direction they've gone in and when especially with relation to how much the reserve fund is and what kind of an increase in maintenance fees have they seen in the last couple of years. So there's a lot of ways that you could. You can't always get the absolute answer, but you can kind of do a little bit of a guess mark. And there's some things that shout out at you or at me. <laughs> so I will pretty much know where it's going. But where we are right now, what is uh, sad is I was actually quite surprised. I think value-wise, there's a lot of good value there. But I am a little bit surprised on some of the maintenance fees, considering that we are dealing with a newer building, not an older building. So those are things that you have to watch out for. I mean, those are things that you really should have a good, solid explanation before you decide to sign on the dotted line and become another buyer within the same complex, because you need these answers. I mean, it's all about affordability, granted, but you also want to know where the direction of that building is going, and that's the only way to find it. You know, there's one group of people, uh, condo owners uh, outside of the city, who have been working diligently for the last several months back and forth trying to, trying to uh, work together as a unity to find answers and obtain answers from their board on a number of different things within their building. The building is older. There's some items that need to be addressed. The sad part is, is that after all these months, while it's bringing some condo owners, uniting them together, which is great because it really is good to work together and try to, uh, 
you know, find a solution. But the sad part is, is that they don't appear to be getting too far too fast. And, you know, sometimes you can, you know, it becomes incredibly frustrating because you start thinking, my God, you know, I'm not getting anywhere with this. It's just not working. And so you, you either have a choice. You can just drop the ball completely and say, forget it, I'm not going to bother anymore because I'm not getting answers and this is just too frustrating. But what I think is really important is, is that if there's a whole bunch of people, if you can unite and get a lot of people in your building to, to step forward and express their concerns in a collaborative approach and document everything, then maybe what you might want to do is uh, try and, as a one unit, get answers as a single unit. But if that doesn't work, then the question is, what do you do? And I honestly wish I had an answer to that, but believe it or not, I don't. My, my instinct, my personal instinct tells me the power of the press is so strong. And I personally believe that if, if you have enough unity within a building, I personally believe that those individuals, those condo owners should go to the press. I think that sometimes some of these board of directors take the power and control that they do only because they don't ever believe that they're going to get caught. And they still think that everything is in confines of their actual building. And so therefore they can protect anything that goes on in their building. So the only way to sometimes get resolution is by taking it outside of the building. And the only way to take it outside of the building is to go to the press. So, you know, does that change and does that hurt your value? No, it doesn't hurt your value. Whatever's going on in your building already is hurting your value. It's already a given. The fact that you're sitting back and not doing anything about it is what's going to continue to hurt the value. I think that if, if condo owners decided that they're going to have the strength and the courage to say enough is enough and stand by their convictions and be confident and say, fine, you know what? Because, you know, don't forget, I mean, everybody knows that everyone's got problems somewhere, <laughs> somewhere along the way. But why would you have, like, if you've got a special assessment that's been given to you as a condo owner, and you've been notified by your board that you now have to pay, I don't know, $8,000 a piece. Every condo owner in the complex has to pay $8,000. And say there's three, you know, 300 owners in this building, and you're all going to have to come up with $8,000. I mean, don't you sit back and wonder why all of a sudden, bang, you've got this? And if you don't get the proper answers from your board, then why would you want to sit back? Sure, you can go and hire a lawyer, but now you've got more expenditures. Once that determination has been made that you're going to have a special assessment, it's already public. It's listed in the status certificate. Anyone that goes and buys into that building is going to find out about it. So it's already market knowledge. As a realtor, if I was to turn around and sell a unit in that building, I will know immediately that the status certificate is going to show me that there's a special assessment and now we're going to have to deal with the issue. So it's, you're not hiding anything. It, it is out there and it's out there where, you know, it could be affected because it's out there with the realtors and we know about it. So the bottom line is, is that, you know, to find out whether or not, you know, things are done properly, there's nothing wrong with going to the press, getting it out in the public eye, make these condo boards accountable for their decisions. And maybe they're going to think twice about it if they feel that it's going to be hitting the marketplace. They may very well just step down and then you don't have a problem any longer. You can put a board in there that's a little bit more conscientious of the way that they manage the affairs of the corporation. You know, it takes a lot of courage to be strong. It's really easy for people to walk, you know, back up and say, forget it. I don't want to get involved in this. It's just too much trouble. It's too much aggravation. Forget it. I'll just pay for it and enough already. But, you know, if I felt that it would stop and end tomorrow, then I'd say, yeah, go ahead and do that. But in most cases, when things start to go wrong, it seems to be a constant path and it doesn't get better. You know, the other day I received a really crazy email and, and I have to admit, I sat there and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. You know, they talk about uh, a condo board having to be of sane, you know, you have to be of sane mind to be eligible to be on a condominium board. So what's sane mind? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's really funny because people that have a sane mind, you know, they could be power stricken. They just love the power. They, uh, they have no intentions of listening to anything about it anybody about anything. They're manipulative, but they're of sane mind. So the interesting thing is when I received this email, I actually, it, it actually tweaked me for a moment because there's an awful lot of medical conditions out there outside of sane mind 
that may not really be a good thing to have with a board of director. So I can't touch that because I'm not an expert in that field, but I have to admit the comment, the comment did really hit me hard. So maybe that is something that should be out on the forefront. You know, the comment that came back to me was, I'm going to read it here, a sociopathic tendencies by mental health. That's what came to me. And then it went on, and, and it was actually from a qualified professional. And it said that sometimes people don't look the part. And in fact, they're usually charming, charismatic, likable, and they come across as being a real trustworthy person. They're, they're a skillful, pathological liar and master manipulator. They're driven by extreme power and control issues with a total sense of entitlement to act on them. They're well-honed, predatory instincts. They lack conscience and they feel no remorse, guilt, or shame, and they can fake it when it suits their purpose. You got to stop and think about that for a moment because, you know, honestly, I, that never even dawned on me at all. You know, years ago when I looked at the Condo Act and I saw the statement, be of sane mind, well, okay, so it's be of sane mind. But really think about this. Think about how many things that we step back and we shake our heads and we wonder, how did somebody do that when we thought that the person next door was an absolutely fantastic person and then we find out that they're a sociopath? So I don't know. I mean, I really think it's food for thought. So I just wanted to throw it out there because if there's any uh, experts, uh, listeners in that medical health world, I would really love for you to contact me, Linda at lindapinazato.com, because certainly I would love to have a conversation on this because I find it incredibly interesting. You are listening to Linda Pinazato here at the Hayes FM at the Condo Expert. We're talking about all different aspects of condominium. Interesting conversation. Love to hear more from uh, all the listeners. But hang on. We'll be right back. <laughs> 